Lawrence, Paul, and Julie, um, and I'll introduce them more formally in just a moment, but I want to just mention um, Deniston Hill. And some of you may know about Deniston Hill, may have even spent time there. Um, it was established in 2004, upstate, by a group of LGBTQ artists, architects, and writers of color, interested in fostering dialogues across disciplines through residencies and a wide range of public programs. For at least five years before, the the farmhouse, barn, and surrounding grounds were a place of exploration, exchange, and re renewal for what would become Deniston Hill's first board of directors. Um, Julie, along with Jessica Rankin, who's here, have um, worked on numerous, enormous, um, large-scale paintings up there. Uh, Paul created um, Orpheus Descending from 2001 upstate. And it is a really unique location with an extraordinary history. Um, and uh, founded by these three extraordinary individuals. Paul Pfeiffer is a visual artist living and working in New York. Uh, his work has been seen in numerous national and international group exhibitions, including the Whitney Biennial here, PS1 Greater New York, the Sydney Biennial, the Honolulu Biennial, Performa 19, uh, and in Venice, among other venues. He is a recipient of a number of awards, most notably an Alpert Award for Visual Arts from CalArts in 2009, uh, a United States Artist Fellowship in 2015, and the inaugural Buxbaum Award from the Whitney Museum in here in 2000. Pfeiffer earned a BFA in printmaking at the San Francisco Art Institute and an MFA from Hunter College and was a participant in the Whitney Independent Study Program. Lawrence Chua is a historian of the global modern built environment with an emphasis on Asian architecture and urban culture. He's an assistant professor at the School of Architecture at Syracuse University. He was, the mo he was most recently a fellow at the International Institute of Asian Studies in Leiden and Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies in the Albert Ludwig Universität. Chua serves on the editorial board of Architectural Histories, the peer-reviewed journal of European Architectural History Network. His writing has appeared in the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, Journal of Architecture, Journal of Urban History, Traditional Dwellings and Settlement Review, and, sorry, I'm going very fast, Senses and Society, I'll slow down. Um, Chua received his PhD in the History of Architecture and Urban Development from Cornell University. And I invite Julie and Paul to come up to the stage. Um, and Lawrence will join us. Here he is. Um, and let's have a seat. Maybe while Julie's making her way up, I was looking at the website. And I wanted to just share what you have written down as values. Um, the title of this program is called Exodus. And we will get to that. But I just wanted to point this out because I think it has so much to do with the really a connection between where you started and, and what you've tried to really maintain. And I know it's, you know, it's ebbed and flowed and you have different moments. Um, but you have hospitality, ethical caring treatment of strangers, community building and stewardship, generative practices, which I'll read a little from, we engage in practice that produces new ideas, outcomes, capabilities and opportunities that build off each other. Um, and translocalism. We operate across national boundaries in connection with other communities around the globe, emphasizing the networks of solidarity and anti-colonial struggle that tie together the hyper-local and the global. Um, so I'm gonna put these notes down and just start more informally to, to ask you to tell us about the roots and the founding of Deniston Hill and what you're really bringing together in this residency. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Christine, um, for that generous introduction. Um, uh, I, some of you, most of you maybe in the room know that, you know, Paul, Julie, and I have been study partners um, really over the last 20 years. I was just, like, thinking about how, yeah, I mean, I, I think our friendship, like, uh, was before that. But, um, uh, yeah, it's um, we've been studying collectively for, for over 20 years. And a lot of these conversations have coalesced around the land at Deniston Hill. Um, you know, and this is a place where I had moved upstate. I'd been teaching design build courses um, that use the land as a classroom. As Christine mentioned, this was where uh, Paul had done his public art project, Orpheus Descending. Julie, um, you know, had done her first large scale paintings in the barn there. But I'd really like to move away from both a kind of linear chronology of Deniston Hill as well as the idea that Deniston Hill is somehow reducible to our individual 
practices, projects, and foreground the collective aspect of what we do. Um, you know, from, from its inception, the land was really what brought us and several other artists, writers, and architects together. And our mission statement, our original mission statement really foregrounded three programmatic areas, and those were agriculture, agriculture education, and, re and the residency. And we were really interested in um, using these three areas to better understand um, stewardship of the land and what that meant in late capitalism, late imperialism. Um, we experimented with cultivation, with using the land as a canvas, as a classroom, as a laboratory, but also creating a refuge and thinking about new approaches develop to development that would really question the idea of the land as simply a resource. Um, and I think in some of the images that you're, you're seeing uh, rotating behind us um, or next to me, um, you, you get a sense of that. Um, I think hopefully one of the images is this sound um, an audio art exhibition that Kara Lynch and Joshua Jarkman co-curated, which really shows how you know we were um, trying to think of the land not just as a resource, but as a in another conversation partner, as another interlocutor. Um, you know, from its very inception, um, we not only foregrounded a fugitive cultural practice through the work of queer black indigenous and people of color practitioners and thinkers, um, but we really wanted to move away from the ontology of the marketplace and more towards a more poetic approach. So when we started programming, we really developed it around themes that did not adhere to imperial, imperial epistemologies or disciplinary divisions, but were really more about um, poesis or an approach that foregrounded world making more than image or object making. So um, some of the themes that we've, um, we've organized um, at Denniston Hill, um, an early one was Holes, um, which was um, based on a painting by Shozo Shimamoto, who was a member of Kutai. Um, I like America and America likes me. Um, uh, uh, Joseph Boys is well known uh, performance. And then um, now, Exodus since 2017. And I, I just want to say that, you know, I think all of these um, themes, all of these ideas that have really guided the direction of Deniston Hill um, were a way of liberating these ideas from, from the stasis of categorization. I don't know if Paul maybe wants to talk a bit about um, Exodus. Yeah. Um, as Lawrence said, uh, we initiated our current thematic exodus in 2017, and seems uh, both not so long ago, but also a long time ago. Um, just remembering that exodus came up uh, in the wake of uh, the 2016 election and, and the first months and, and years of, uh, of the, the Trump presidency. So there was in the air uh, an overwhelming uh, feeling of something like an expulsion, a, a deracination, um, a real departure uh, from some idea, perhaps of like uh, a set of familiar circumstances or um, uh, conditions into something totally unknown and, um, uh, and disorienting. Um, at the same time, you know, there was a a kind of, uh, well, humor at the time that uh, what was a new kind of shock for some was actually uh, familiar for others. Um, uh, so in a sense, it was nothing new. It's just that it, in a way, became uh, something more on the radar for, for more people. Um, so uh, in a way, since 2017, we've been exploring what exactly Exodus means to us, uh, and um, this has taken the form of a, 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 a reading group um, over the past uh, um, couple of years. Most recently, we've just finished reading the Zora Neale Hurston novel, uh, Moses, Man of the Mountain, um, which has been sort of, well, over a period of months, a group of us have been meeting and reading chapter by chapter, along with accompanying texts that draw out uh, different aspects of the theme. Um, and sort of within that 
there is an understanding that, that Exodus, as we uh, have inherited it from the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, is really something like a matrix, um, not just a biblical narrative, although it is that, and a kind of fundamental narrative, one of the first, I mean, one of the five fundamental chapters or books of the Torah, um, you know, really like a kind of primary, originary piece of literature, a code, a structure of narration from which, in a sense, all other narrations have built. Um, so it's really like, it's a pattern set a long time ago that has been repeated and repeated and the kind of neurological studies that we're looking at comes to mind. Um, and in a way, a particular aspect, maybe one nuance of, of, of Exodus worth focusing on is the notion that it, what it represents is an ontology of, uh, of like group relations, yeah. like how we formulate ideas you know, the, that, uh, of how we live together, uh, how we relate to each other in the world. So, I mean, in a sense, uh, it's really like ground zero, which is why I like call it a matrix for um, like a set of inherited political categories. And, and I, I think ultimately, uh, there's so much to say about it, but what I really wanna say is that I think what's at stake in our exploration is uh, the idea that uh, the inherited categories have uh, exposed their limits yeah. Yeah. and that we're a point in, in our sort of collective experience um, as a species or however you want to call it, that the sort of the, the, the nature of prioritizing a process of naming of, of, of the verbal channel as, uh, as, as a kind of, and the, and the notion of logic as kind of the primary way of transmitting knowledge from gener generation to generation is exposed uh, a limit and in a way a failure. And so there's this idea that, you know, there's something native about the way that artists uh, think and, and work and relate to language um, that goes beyond the verbal and into a kind of more widely sensory realm. You know, uh, I think Julie's yeah. uh, work is an awesome example of that. Uh, and I feel like her, Julie's way of kind of even constructing the interdisciplinary dialogue today reminds me of the nature of her paintings. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think I want to get to that and talk about um, how this kind of is realized or expressed in the work, but in, in the spirit of what Lawrence was saying before about kind of uh, breaking up and breaking down uh, the kind of history and chronology, I just wanted to mention something around Exodus. Um, I was watching a, a video that's on YouTube, a talk that the three of you were involved with, with I think Prem Krishnamurthy, Krishnamurthy in June of 2020, so right after Floyd, um, the murder of, of George Floyd. Um, and you said, Paul, um, you were talking about, I'm gonna paraphrase here, Exodus as an analogy to the state of the socio-political realm, as you saw it, I think that's around the founding. Um, the traditional institutions of democracy seem to be collapsing, and the supposed line between the symbolic order and the real seem to be collapsing, uh, and then you talk about social media, the wormhole where everything seems to be normal, but it's glitching. Um, it reveals things that are not what they seem in a matrix that represents a kind of ontological angst. We appear to be in one reality, like a hall of mirrors. Where the fuck are we? Movement out of bondage into the desert, spaces of uncertainty. Um, you talk a bit about uh, Paolo Verno's exodus um, as, a place under, uh, as a starting point to understand. If the nation state is a platform from which stability can be built, that platform is gone, though the facade still exists. Which stability can be built? That platform is gone, though the, f sorry, sorry, um, the f sorry, I just repeated myself. Focus on conversation about this through Exodus. 
but hitting the facade. We are not on the same page. We are embedded in the neoliberal establishment, that's a question, yet still going for it in ways, and then you kind of talk about funding and these sort of structures that exist. So I wonder if maybe you can talk about that kind of, that, that problematic around the ontological, the tension between having these kinds of radical, you know, open-ended ways of experimentation and moving forward, yet within the kind of institutional structures that exist, and then maybe we can talk about the manifestations in, in Julie's work. Okay, well, well, just to begin, I think, I think like, we, like we, we all bring our own particular practices into this co co collaboration and um, community-based project that we think of as Denison Hill. So I think um, that all of our work kind of is, it work, it, we, it, we've had this history, like Lauren says, said, of studying together for the last 20 years. And I really think of Denison Hill as a site of study and a place of study and a place of collective study and a collective work in that way. And so that while there are artists who come and work on their own projects, and all of us have done that, Paul, myself, Lawrence, uh, in addition to the many different writers and artists and architects and thinkers who we've inv invited up, but the bigger kind of bigger job project that's happening, or the more kind of what I find more interesting about what happens up there is the discourse that happens with each other and the kind of collective study that happens and where we, we can poke at each other's work and, and try and through this collective study arrive somewhere in terms of furthering the, a, an experiment, um, whatever that experiment, thought, thought experiment might be. So in the Exodus reading group, we like the study of Exodus, as Paul mentioned, and the failures of that and the kind of exposed failures of that. And, the story of Exodus is basically the story of uh, mining liberation, of searching for liberation, and this loss of, and this being at loss in the, in this haze, and in, and and not even having language for how to negotiate that. And some for the desire to return to slavery and bondage, and for some to trying to invent new modes. But but how do you then within those in those in that space and in those gaps build something else? So I guess I just I didn't I don't know if I'm going away from. The contradiction you're bringing up, but I think it's better if, if we just talk, we keep the conversation around DH and and the collective work we're trying to negotiate together. Then that manifests differently for each of us. I think very Paul has done a lot of work with Exodus in, in terms of curating exhibitions and um, his own work and his own projects in that, as well as bringing Exodus as a major conversational theme for our for our investigations through DH collectively. What you're both saying reminds me that I meant to say that, you know, there's, there's a central question that I feel like we've, we've come to focus on, uh, which is the, the, the nature of Exodus being that, you know, as a pattern that has repeated over generations, uh, there's, there's a major tension in which one way to read this narrative is as the birth of nationhood. Um, and, and and yet another way to read it is that minus a certain desire or like aspiration for the happy ending, uh, which to me is like the sugar, um, you know, Exodus could also be understood as being simply about the, the movement from this, the state of state slavery uh, into the wilderness. Um, and like taken ontologically, you know, uh, to me, that's where, where it becomes, uh, well, the suggestions presented by uh, Kojo and Angelica uh, uh, the, about the, the nature of neologisms yeah. or the invention of new language in the expanded sense uh, uh, or, or the invention of new form as, as, as generative. Um, just comes to mind. Um, in a way, to me, it's like a, it's a tension between the desire for closure um, or to give something a name uh, versus a kind of recognition of the value of complexity um, that might require a kind of like building a tolerance um, for uh, a lack of closure. Um, and and the kind of aspirations, you know, that might lead to, you know, nationalism as a kind of immediate um, 
goal, if one's not careful. So I just want to maybe, in, in a way, reiter uh, like uh, remember that there's a um, the full title of the thematic that we're exploring is uh, Exodus, the Ethics and Aesthetics of Uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, the uncertainty part, um, to me, seems like, I, I mean, I don't want to even say anything because I feel like everything about today has been about really detailing what that could mean. Um, I, I'm not sure what to say. Uh, Okay, I can. I'll, I, I'll ask you a question then directly, or maybe okay. we'll lead into that. But um, I think taking on taking taking like I think we can talk a little bit about the Exodus Media Workshop. Um, one thing that really became apparent for us at Denison Hill is we were already in the process of rethinking how we wanted to manifest that 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 project. Um, not just in the land upstate and as an artisan residency, as a place of retreat, as a place of refuge, and as a place of safety, a place of safety for people of color in the land, a place of, um, of mining and, and exploration and freedom in that land, and, and how, how, how powerful and potent that is, that is and how, much, how necessary that is for a form of creative thinking. But that also, um, we wanted to kind of rethink what Denniston Hill could actually create and make in that space collectively, um, and how to think of Denniston Hill as an artwork, and how to think of Denniston Hill as um, having that form of creative agency itself, not just as this site of of making, but as a being a maker, being a participating in the contribution of continuing um, aesthetics around this idea of exodus and. Um, one of the projects that I think would be great to talk about a little bit more, both of you guys can add to it, is the Exodus Media Workshop as a manifestation or as a, one of our programs that's going to really look into trying to generate an artwork, um, which is a very new kind of terrain for us at DH. I, I, I have something to say now. <laughs> I, Julie, Julie and Paul really made me think about um, maybe the to put these two things into conversation with one another. One was how, you know, in many ways, the, the narrative of Exodus, you know, as Paul pointed out, is, you know, perhaps in the hands of like, um, you know, Cecil B. DeMille, a story of the triumphant, um, the, the triumph of, of the nation state, right? That, that the Exodus resolves in the creation of a powerful nation, um, you know, out of the wilderness. But I think another way of reading the narrative of Exodus is, um, has to do with the failure of the nation state and in many ways redirects an understanding of that narrative as being about the formulation of a new covenant, a new covenant with nature, God, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think it's that latter interpretation of Exodus that I think resonates with me and I think you know, across the projects that are developing out of, this, um, out of the theme of Exodus. I think the other thing, you know, that Julie brought up is this idea of like, of art making. And I think increasingly, you know, in our discussions, in our conversations, we've really been moving away from the idea of like the production of an object as, as art and thinking about um, really trying to reorient uh, ourselves towards uh, um, an idea of world making. Um, and, and here I'm thinking of the ways that, um, uh, folks like Ariela Aisha Azule have reread Hannah Arendt and Paul Ricoeur. Um, you know, their their understanding of this idea of world making, right? That there is there is something that precedes art. There is something that prece precedes all of the disciplines that we've we've inherited, all of the disciplinary language that we've inherited. That really emerges out of the colonial encounter. That emerges out of the imperial project. And I think that if you look at things that um, well, Azule talks about the Benin bronzes, um, you know, as like um, these um, these elements that were part of the making of worlds before colonialism. That colonialism transformed into commodities, into objects, into into art that can be displayed in museums. And I think that there's a part of Exodus that I think has to do with the excavation of that, like, that pre-imperial consciousness, that pre-colonial consciousness. And I'm not suggesting that that pre-imperial or pre-colonial consciousness is in any way pastoral, 
but that there are still valuable things that I think we can learn from that as we move beyond these categories that we've inherited. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, to say a little bit about the, the media workshop, uh, this is an idea for, in a way, picking up the baton of a generation's old conversation about um, experimental education. Um, you know, like inherited from f folks like uh, Paulo Freire and, um, uh, and others who, in a way, made a connection between traditional modes of uh, teaching and learning and the replication of, of colonial values. Um, that, in a way, what's required in traditional teaching is not the activation of young minds, but really that the, the mind becomes something like an empty vessel merely to be filled with information. Um, so there's a tradition of a kind of radical questioning of that and the desire to seek alternatives. You know, education as a kind of mode of facilitation or of, of uh, knowledge production that actually primarily seeks to, to activate um, minds. And, um, Another program is, is the community garden. Um, but these are programs that we're only in the beginning of, of really getting to. Um, Denison Hills is, is about to uh, complete the process of, of getting a new executive director. And um, there's, they're really entering a new chapter. And so, uh, I mean, I, what I want to say is that they're, like we're, um, I mean, what, what a community garden really is um, remains a question. Um, but one thing that it immediately like suggests is that um, it's relational and that uh, as Lawrence was saying, you know, it, it's a project that seeks to do something more than just like plant and have a harvest per se but that, you know, the community component of it, um, you know, uh, like, um, is something dialogical. I mean, that, you know, has to do with cultivating relationships uh, in our area of upstate New York in Sullivan County um, and, and, and discovering, like, what the conditions, uh, the demographics, the, the, the kind of economic conditions uh, um, are. Yeah. And so how does that, that work with the, the communal garden? Well, some of the ideas are, um, I mean, I think, I think we're going into the, into the de details of DH and we have like a lot of other yeah. kind of concepts. No, but it's okay. But I think the community garden we're thinking of as this forum, like in the rural communities, you don't really have a kind of form that you do in urban centers. Sullivan County is a strange county because it went for Trump and for Antonio Delgado. Explain that. Like, how, does, how do you split a ticket that way? And that happens in places like Sullivan County. It's one of the most depressed communities economically um, disenfranchised or whatever you want to call it, communities in the Catskills it, and in upstate New York. And yet it has such rich diversity of community in the urban centers like Monticello and places like that, as well as having, um, t as well as holding two of the, our uh, maximum security and minimum security facility in that same county. So our community is this mixture of rural farmers, artists and thinkers and people who left um, the city to kind of invent different types of lives upstate and this very kind of mixed rural um, working class, whatever you want to call it, community up there that it has a very different kind of um, history. And how do we create a place where these kind of communities could come together? What, what is a forum that is required for that? And if the garden can be one version of that, um, and it's interesting because all forms of neighbors participate in this garden, whether they're people who work as a contracting firm or people who work with um, actual farmers, um, some people who are surveyors, a census surveyor, different, different out, uh, people in our community will participate. In, and our desire is to, is to further that, is to actually have the community garden be a place of workshop experiments, learning, um, liberatory pedagogy, but also be this site of, you know, 
kind of discourse. And when you can get people together and talk about politics or talk about whatever else you want to talk about, it's un unbelievable how many small things start to change, like within the fire department, within the police department, within particular ways that these communities order. But just how do we situate ourselves there as well to be safe in, our, in, in the context of our neighbors on this 200 acre campus um, that is owned by people who, or that is taken, um, not owned is the wrong word, but what is it? What am I looking for? Like, um, the, by. yeah, yeah. T taken care of and nurtured by people who are, at, at, and, and, and you know, we're the custodians of this land for the moment in a way that it can, that is access to, every, gives access to everyone else, but also can be this kind of platform for this kind of, um, this other form of investigation. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think, sorry, Paul, go ahead. You're going to say something. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, I mean, just in a way to kind of like broadly describe the connection between, uh, well, we have this, one of the ideas that we've been really, that we've been talking a lot about is that, um, well, it's something that came out of a conversation with uh, um, Project Eats, uh, the Linda Good Bryant um, Urban Farm uh, Program. Uh, it was this idea that, uh, in fact, a very unlikely um, connection exists between image making and, and food production, um, images and food being two Most things that we consume daily. Um, and so, I mean, just to set that as just like a, a one way to think about Absolutely. the community garden and this kind of pedagogical project called the, the Exodus Media Workshop, um, there's this idea that, you know, what we're dealing with um, is a situation in which our taste buds, the way we consume our patterns of consumption have been engineered. And uh, the nature of that is that it's immersive. So in a way it's invisible. The ways in which these things have been modified and, and shaped, um, we're so in it that we can't see it happening. It's like the fish can't see the water. So um, where artists come in, is that uh, there's, in a way that, uh, there's an idea that by engaging in the kinds of creation of new form of the, the neological <laughs> experiments that artists, poets um, are, are, are native to, that um, there is the potential to, um, in some ways, like not go back, but to move forward with the new kinds of like neurological knowledge that are emerging to like fully embrace it and to see the possibility to like go beyond the kind of logical demo kind of capitalist democratic structures that we're told are constitute the limit of what's possible into new uncharted territories. I mean, in a way, I, I, that's how I interpret when we talk about the uh, story of Exodus, one way to read it is the story of a certain failure. The failure is a failure of imagination. Like the failure is not to question hard enough what we've been told is the limit of what's possible. Yes. And if I, could, if I could maybe build on that, um, you know, I think that uh, one way you might think of like both of these projects that we've been talking about the the garden and the the media workshop you know is as as platforms to reimagine a new covenant right with with um, well in the case of the garden with with the earth in which like that relationship is not defined by extraction you know or in the case of the workshop where that relationship to creativity is not defined by production right that you know I think for me, this returns again to this idea of world making in which, you know, the point of these creative endeavors is not to extract or produce something, is not to like create and, you know, something that can be solidified in an object, you know, ideas are created into like an object that can be, then be displayed, uh, sold, circulated, etc. Right. But that this is a very different process. In fact, like the, the product doesn't even matter in the end. Right. What matters is you know, 
this new relationship, these new relational aspects. And I think maybe you can say the same thing about um, you know, any kind of pedagogical endeavor, right? That um, the, the goal of our, of our, you know, the goal of higher education, uh, at least in, you know, uh, the neoliberal world is to reproduce the working force, right? Um, and I think that there must be like some other way of understanding, um, uh, you know, pedagogy as, as a liberatory practice. as well as making and growing. <laughs> Can I do Sorry. one yeah, shout out? Yeah. Just in, in, in line with, uh, I mean, one thing I'm excited that I think we can announce about like uh, the partnership with, uh, with Recess. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, just as one example, a kind of concrete example of like where, where we're headed um, is that uh, we've, we, we have, um, entered into a partnership with another organization in New York City called uh, Recess. Um, like, and to, to my mind, like uh, an organization at the forefront of, of exploring ways, not just of um, enacting uh, like really progressive, um, like radical forms of, of education, but um, what's interesting about Recess is a, a commitment to, to really like seeing artists as uh, people who should be placed in a posi position of leadership in this process. Um, uh, we're one of three organizations that have um, uh, recently partnered with Recess, um, who over the course of the, the coming year are going to be uh, inventing um, uh, through enacting um, like a, a new pedagogies um, that will engage uh, that will be led by artists um, and uh, will engage um, communities at risk. Uh, not to go on, but yeah. yeah. I just wanted to um, throw something out there to you all in thinking about these new liberatory kind of relationships, practices, possibilities, potentials, and moving into the future, which clearly, you know, the kind of experiment thus far and you know where things can really open up. Uh, I think someone said earlier um, about your show here that what it looked like in 2019 and you know what it looks like, I mean obviously at two different venues, but in 2021, you know, just time has changed. So much has happened in that period of time where then the vibrations of the work, the abstraction, everything inside becomes kind of reactivated in a different way. And I, I just want to throw this out there if, if you want to respond. How can um, these, the tumultuous years of 2020 and 2021, how have they kind of maybe, you know, shifted, opened up, you know, created this type of, you know, obviously we talked about a bit about uncertainty and this moment. Um, throw, I'm just throwing that out there if that's, if you want to respond to that. You want to I mean, I think I mentioned it earlier that that um, we had started with a th this exodus as a basis of thematic from 2018, 17, and it was in 2000, at the end of 2019, that we sat down together and said, either we're going to make Deniston Hill something that's a lot more potent and that can actually do something else for our engagement in it, and with our engagement in a place of study, or we're going to stop. It's been it's been almost 15 years. We don't need to continue. We I mean we can, but what 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 do we really want this to be? And then three months later, we're in the throes of a pandemic. And I think that we it was an opportune time for us to to not have artists in residence. We met what every week or every other week. I mean every week or twice a week to really think through new programs, to think through these ideas to establish the reading group and, be, and, and begin this form of just deep collective study and, and process in ourselves. Paul started um, some other seminars. You did photo voice. Um, you did uh, deep listening, or you're in the middle of doing the deep listening workshops. Maybe you can talk about that for a minute. But just that we, we started to really think deeply and really ask difficult questions of each other and of our organization and why we needed to be. And what, what would, what, how could we be creative in this, in, not just by having this space, but how could we actually be doing something that is constructing some kind of um, 
infrastructure, even if it's just an ontological infrastructure, for how to think through some of this stuff. And I think, in part, that's part of the reason that this, that the kind of concept of collective presentation and collective learning and this form of group study that we're even participating in here today is a, is a part of that 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 kind of Denison Hill thinking. Um, and if you want to talk yeah, specifically well, about those two programs, yeah, the programs that Julie's mentioning are um, like early stages of exploring existing. Uh, like methodologies invented by artists. Um, deep listening is, uh, is a sound-based kind of laboratory uh, in, uh, invented by uh, or and, and trademarked by an artist, uh, Pauline Oliveros. Um, and uh, Recess is another one, um, uh, a, a kind of uh, not just educational method, but uh, really like a, a, an approach to using performance and gesture uh, uh, to um, uh, like engage a group in collective learning. Um, in a way, the, the, the commonality between the different programs that we've been looking into is uh, that they're in some ways nonverbal in nature. Um, uh, they're artists led and um, I mean I think the thing I want to say in relation to like what's changed between 2019 and 2021 is that obviously we something has happened um, it's it's undeniable I mean the question for me is really like in some ways you know whether to think of it as a kind of like how radical is the break I mean a break has taken place the question is like, you know, how radical is it? Can we go back? Uh, where do we go from here? So, I mean, in some ways, like what we're wrestling with now is, and maybe w what constitutes something like the, the sugar or the aspiration of wanting to like close the circle and come to a resolution about the break that we've gone through is an idea that the, the, the corrective has to do with you know, diversification, um, a certain expansion of the canon, let's say. Um, there is, though, like a glimmer, a question, uh, like a whisper of an, a murmur of this idea that what we're dealing with is something much deeper, that what's being exposed is that the, the very ontology that we've taken as a kind of envelope um, you know, is, is uh, proving to have had uh, a major blind spot or blind spots kind of uh, at, at the core. I mean, in some ways, one of the things, one of the questions that's coming up in the training of deep listening is the extent to which deep listening actually is based on um, Asian uh, traditions of healing and philosophy like Tai Chi um, and, and, and generally sort of body work, um, as well as uh, from, you know, like uh, Ayurvedic and, and uh, South Asian um, traditions, uh, which leads to the question of like, <laughs> um, you know, in a way, uh, like where is the new information really coming from? Um, and, and, and a related question is, you know, to what extent has the very, like, container of modernity uh, been dependent on uh, non-Western traditions Absolutely. that have been suppressed all along? Yeah. Um, and, and perhaps, like, what we are actually dealing with now, looking at Exodus and the kind of exploration that we're moving into right now on a deeper level is, is a kind of reconnecting with you know, these blind spots that have been imposed as a kind of like erasure, um, reconnecting with, you know, in a way, the traditions of, that have undergirded modernity all along, uh, but that have been suppressed as such. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can connect what Paul was saying to things that Adrian Edwards has said in the past about like, you know, um, 
modernity being black at its inception, that there's no, you know, special category for like, you know, black modernity, indigenous modernity, you know, uh, immigrant modernity, Asian modernity, whatever. Um, and that, yeah, this is an opportunity like to rethink, a, you know, to rethink those categories, as Paul said, that we've, we've inherited through colonialism. But I think, you know, I, I think at this kind of like moment, at this historical moment, it's really important not to think of like, um, a return to something, you know, whether that return is to like some imagined pastoral, like, you know, pre-colonial Eden or a return to like some kind of neoliberal normativity, which, you know, I, I kind of feel like every, things are, things are speeding up. And I feel like every five minutes, there is more proof that there is no return to that kind of like neoliberal sense of normativity, that we are like, in the wilderness, we have maybe always been in the wilderness, and we will continue to be in the wilderness. Thank so, you, yeah. That's a great ending. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if, Lawrence, if you're still listening, thank you for both being brief and blowing our mind a little bit at the very end. Um, I'm now very happy to introduce our final speaker for the day, the esteemed Tracy K. Smith. Thank you for being here from the very earliest moment of the day and still being here with us and for the incredible poem you're about, poems you're about to share with us. Um, she is a poet and educator, the author of four books of poetry, including Life on Mars, 2011, um, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, an incredible book if you haven't read it. Um, she's a professor of English and of African and African American studies at Harvard University. In 2014, she was awarded the Academy of American Poets Fellowship and was appointed Poet Laureate of the United States that same, in 2017. Other awards and honors include a 2004 Rona Jaffe Writers Award, a 2008 Essence Literary Award, a grant from the Ludwig Vogelstein Foundation, a fellowship from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and a 2005 Whiting Award. She earned her BA from Harvard University and her MFA in Creative Writing from Columbia University. Thank you, Tracy. Oh. Thank you so much. I feel so uh, fed um, by today and so um, so assured that the work of questioning and building and making and unmaking is the essential work that we need to be doing. Um, so thank you for that. And Julie, thank you for your work and the, the monument of it and for allowing or inviting all of us with our different voices and vocabularies to kind of build something together. So um, I guess I kind of want to say before I read a, a few new poems is that as a poet, my sense of abstraction is that it allows us to see the correspondences between things that logically ought not to be able to speak or to touch one another. But of course, we know that they do and they must. And when we're willing to move around differently within the world and within the world of ourselves, we can be party to that conversation, um, those echoes, those um, even forms of discord. And so that's what I'm listening for um, when I'm trying to build a poem. And I'm also trying to find something that can be liberatory, um, as the last conversation Paul um, kind of invited us to think about. Um, I want to share some new poems that emerge out of this past year and a half. Um, and for me, they're really different in terms of how they are conceived. Um, they're coming out of what feels like an abstract process of um, what I'll just shorthand as meditative dialogue that feels... Um, like it can do what art does, transcend space, time, logic, and make things that seemed gone or unreachable newly useful. So that, that's what I'll say about these poems. And when I say meditative dialogue, I feel like I'm really talking to, to some folks. <laughs> this is a poem called Riot. Maybe I'll open with a little... Um, epigraph from Gwendolyn Brooks. 
This is the urgency. Live and have your blooming in the noise of the whirlwind, which of course comes from her second sermon on the warp land. Riot. Sometimes I feel the black in my heart like a map made of tar. You need only part your lips to mar what isn't yours. Think better. Don't bother. Your druthers clog my sieve is the matter. We pay to live. Our nerves carry a charge. We grieve each day. We pray for you. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. How thick is memory? How deep the grave? Thick is memory. Deep the grave. How many are we? Many are we? What have we been led here to learn, to teach? We have been led here to learn, to teach. Is life within our grasp? Life within is in our grasp. Have we ever felt death so near as we do this year? Have we ever? Near, dear, year upon year. The ancestors live upstairs in a room without chairs. When I visit, they welcome me without words. They crouch, encircling me. They are without edges. Wordless, they fill me. Warmth without weight. I ask for something. Without shame, I beg. They owe me nothing, but they give. They give. Can you hold my death in your mind? Can you leave it there, live and let grieve? I like you, and like you, I move through the days. A dark shape is what my body makes. Good is how I was taught to look, to be, despite what's done to me. Woe is me. To say is to do is also true. Woe is you. This is not the riot. This is reality. It rolls, roils, briefly recoils. It hammers down. We fall, rebound. You chase. We race. You hate. We wait. Um, I love the, I mean, what I see upstairs is worlds churning away upon one another, emerging and submerging, and um, there's something rising up in every one of your paintings that, that fills me. Um, and this is a poem that I hope is kind of in conversation with that sense. It's called, We Feel Now a Largeness Coming On. Being called all manner of things from the dictionary of shame. Not English, not words, not heard, but worn, born, carried, never spent. We feel now a largeness coming on, something passing into us. We know not in what source it was begun, but wrapped we watch it rise through our fallen, 
are slain, our millions dragged, chained, like daylight setting leaves alight, green to gold to blinding white, like a spirit caught, flame in flesh. I watched a woman try to shake it once from her shoulders and hips, a wild, annihilating fright. Other women formed a wall around her, holding back what clamored to rise. God, devil, ancestor, what black bodies carry through your schools, your cities. Do you see how mighty you've made us, all these generations running every day? stealing ourselves against it. Every day, coaxing it back into coils, and all the while, feeding it, and all the while, loving it. I started this next poem thinking about a dear friend who lost her mother early in um, the pandemic year. And as somebody who has lost my mother as well, I was thinking, oh, they know each other now. They're together somewhere. And then the thought kind of expanded a little bit. And I was thinking, well, that maybe that's true for all of us, all the mothers um, in the beyond. Um, and what if that means that those who would not have wanted or perhaps thought they needed to have anything to do with one another are also kind of comprehending um, themselves and us in a different way. So this poem came out of that. It's called Mothership. You cannot see the mothership in space, it and she being made of the same thing. All our mothers hover there in the ceaseless blue-black, watching it ripple and dim to the prized pale blue in which we spin, we who are black, and you too. Our mothers know each other there, fully and finally. They see what some here see and call anomaly the way the sight of me might set off a shiver in another mother's son, a deadly silent digging in, a stolid refusal to budge, the viral urge to stake out what on solid ground is authority and sometimes also territory. Our mothers, knowing better, Call it folly. Um, I'll read just two more um, poems, uh, one from this sequence that I've been reading from, and then another that's um, written for today. Um, this is called, I Ask for Someone Who Has Lived It, Any Part of It. She guards her face keeps it her own. When she turns and light grazes it, all I can gather is light. Rise and swirl, presence in water, downward tug, drag and lurch, God risen, shattered into liquid patter. I ask what part of it we are living now. I can't tell if she has come forward to answer me or if I am simply here too, out beyond the shallows. Red light of dusk and something gold, hot, bright, knifing the horizon.
And this is a, a brand new poem, um, Soaring. Above the reek of smoke, food, love, history is granular, like rubble or gravel. Some scale tall mounds to stand for a while in the days of dominion, which is brief. History is granular, like rubble or gravel. The young, well, some, ascend without struggle to the days of dominion. It is brief. Like anything, the soul must sleep, rage, grieve. The young, some, ascend through struggle to whatever strength the age requires. Like anything, the soul weeps, raves, gives itself over to life's churn and return, to whatever strength the age requires. My black daughter and sons, they, them, moving soundly through life's churn and return in bodies brown and inviolable, let it be. My black daughter and sons, they, them, scaling mountains to crouch for a while, sifting earth that is, let it be brown, inviolable, above the reek of our smoke, food, love. Thank you.